101 famous poems. The Man with the Hole by Edwin Markham Written after seeing Millet's world-famous painting of a brutalized toiler. Spoken and with commentary by E. T. Hansen God made man in his own image. In the image of God made he him. Genesis Bowed by the weight of centuries, he leans upon his hoe and gazes on the ground. The emptiness of ages in his face and on his back, the burden of the world. Who made him dead to rapture and despair, a thing that grieves not and that never hopes, stolid and stunned, a brother to the ox? Who loosened and let down this brutal jaw? Whose was the hand that slanted back this brow? Whose breath blew out the light within this brain? Is this the thing the Lord God made and gave to have dominion over sea and land, to trace the stars and search the heavens for power, to feel the passions of eternity. Is this the dream he dreamed, who shaped the suns and marked their ways upon the ancient deep? Down all the caverns of hell to their last gulf, there is no shape more terrible than this, more tongued with censure of the world's blind greed, more filled with signs and portents for the soul, more packed with danger to the universe. What gulfs between him and the seraphim, slave of the wheel of labor? What to him are Plato and the swing of Pleiades? What the long reaches of the peaks of song, the drift of dawn, the reddening of the rose. Through this dread shape the suffering ages look. Time's tragedy is in that aching stoop. Through this dread shape humanity betrayed, plundered, profaned and disinherited, cries protest to the judges of the world, a protest that is also prophecy. O masters, lords, and rulers in all lands, is this the handiwork you give to God, this monstrous thing distorted and soul-quenched? How will you ever straighten up this shape, touch it again with immortality, give back the upward looking and the light, rebuild in it the music and the dream, make right the immemorial infamies perfidious wrongs, immedicable woes. O masters, lords, and rulers in all lands, how will the future reckon with this man? How answer his brute questions in that hour when whirlwinds of rebellion shake all shores? How will it be with kingdoms and with kings, with those who shaped him to the thing he is, when this dumb terror shall rise to judge the world after the silence of the centuries. The Unexpected Satisfaction of Work As a kid, I was the bookworm type. Sports terrified me. 
Physical labor was an evil to be eradicated from the face of the earth. One day I was assigned to help out on some church project with a lot of other kids. I forget what the project was now, but it entailed digging in red dirt with a shovel. I came home with blistered and dirty hands. I was exhausted and everything hurt. When my mother saw me, she nearly screamed and exclaimed that it was the first time she'd seen me with dirt under my fingernails. I still remember the happiness in her voice. I remember that shower, too. As I stood there, the warm water washing all the sweat and red dirt and exhaustion off of me, it felt strangely good, satisfying. The exhaustion, the way my muscles ached, it was a good ache. The tiredness, it was a fulfilling tiredness. The fulfillment you feel after accomplishing something with great exertion. It had never felt so good to feel so wrung out. We have a contradictory, almost schizophrenic relationship to work. We dislike it. We avoid it. We complain about it. It's a duty, an obligation, nothing we would ever do willingly. We'd all rather be lying on a beach somewhere. Yet, with very few exceptions, it determines who we are and how we live our lives. It's our biggest source of self-esteem, and when we retire, we will probably miss it. The history of hating work goes back to the beginnings of our culture itself. When we tell the story of the Garden of Eden, we tend to focus on the serpent and the nakedness and the apple. But the other big part of the story is the punishment for eating that apple. Adam and Eve are sentenced to spend the rest of their lives working and suffering under the hardship of work. Mankind has hated work since work was invented. Our aversion to and need for work is a great opportunity for politicians to manipulate us. Populist politicians often paint the worker as an exploited, pitiable victim of an unfair society whom they, the politicians, will save. Once the politician gets into office, though, he changes his tune. All of a sudden, the worker is not the victim, but the hero and the backbone of the nation, and it's time for him to get back to work. Work will never go away, and the big part of work will always be repetitive and mind-numbing, and nothing is going to change that. Robots will take over some jobs and make other jobs easier, but no politician messiah will ever save the worker from work. Edwin Markham wrote his poem, The Man with the Hoe, after viewing a French painting of a farmer leaning, exhausted and broken, on his hoe in a dark, blasted field. I'm sure the poet saw the painting in a museum, which he visited because that's what people of his social class do. Markham was highly educated and an educator and spent much of his life surrounded by highly educated people. I have to confess, when I imagine him standing there, feeling sorry for this farmer with whom he had so little in common, I don't like the poem. It feels condescending to me, self-serving. Is the average farmer really a brother to the ox? Does the common man or woman who works with his or her hands really have the light in their brains blown out? If that's true, would a better job solve the problem? Does working in a less physical job make you a better person? I suspect not. In fact, I can imagine the opposite, that working physically and exhaustingly can give your soul a dimension you can't get sitting at a desk writing a smart poem. We probably spent nearly half of our adult lives working. That would imply that life, to a large degree, is work. Maybe we should not look at work as something we do to get the money to live, but as living. 
Maybe work is a central part of our purpose. Maybe work is not the punishment, but the reward. I still suffer from a natural aversion to physical labor, but when I have a good day of writing, after putting many hours into it, I feel a similar exhaustion to what I felt under the shower as a kid. The exhaustion is more mental than physical, but that feeling of being wrung out, emptied, having given my all, that's the same feeling. It's a satisfying, even fulfilling thing. And the opposite is also true. When I don't put in a good day of work, I feel nervous, dissatisfied, and disoriented. We are made, I believe, to work. It is part of why we are here, and it contributes as much to our spirits as does learning to read and write. Whether physical labor or intellectual and spiritual or white-collar desk work, it doesn't matter. Work satisfies us. It fills our souls. It makes us feel like we are doing what we are here to do. When we work, we produce something a row of corn, or a car. We produce an insurance form and make it possible for someone to get the money they need. We serve some stranger his lunch or teach a child a skill they will need later in life. We don't think about it, but in fact we are using our energy to impress our will upon the world, to contribute something to the world, to change the world according to our desires. We are creating the world anew. On the one hand, we are creatures, creation, products of nature. But at the same time, we also create this world we live in. And we do that by working. I admire the worker, any kind of worker. Anyone who produces something, who expends him or herself to bring forth something that was not there before. I admire them for getting up in the morning, though they would prefer to sleep in, for facing the drudgery and exertion, for investing that energy, that chunk of their lives, into a thing that is not pleasurable, in order to change the world in some small way. I do not pity the worker. For me, he or she is always a hero. About Edwin Markham, 1852 to 1940. Edwin Markham was an American educator and poet and the poet laureate of Oregon. He was born in Oregon City, the youngest of ten children and the child of divorce. In early youth, his mother moved the family to California, where he was a member of the first graduating class of what is now San Jose University. He taught literature in El Dorado County and was principal of Tompkins Observation School in Oakland, California. He married three times. With his third wife, he moved to Rio de Janeiro to study natives, then to New York City, where they lived in Brooklyn and then Staten Island. Markham was a Freemason. He corresponded regularly with many writers of his day and amassed a library of over 15,000 books. He wrote The Man with the Hoe when he was 46, and it made him famous. His poem, Lincoln, the Man of the People, was read at the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial. 